welcome back to another video. This is Motivation for Young Christians. Welcome back, welcome back. Today we're going to be learning about finances. Here we have a special guest. We have Brother Frederick here to educate us on finance. Brother Frederick, please introduce yourself by saying your name, your profession, how long you've been doing your profession, and the church you currently attend. Awesome. My name is Frederick Tiles. I am an accountant. Um, I have been in the industry since 1999. I've been in the industry since 99, right? Um, church I currently attend is... Um, Church City in Jamaica, New York. That's where I'm at. This is part two, guys. We have the other five questions. We're going to go straight into the questions for today. Uh, now we're moving into our sixth question for today. Why should a person understand gross versus net pay? Oh, PGK, you're talking about the employees now, right? So gross, you, you want to know what the difference between gross and net is. And I mean, it, it. I say it's simple because I've been doing it for a minute, but everything is predicated on your gross pay if you're an employee. Right. Um, when people ask, you know, how much money you make annually, you don't give them the net figure because you can't calculate that. <laughs> you give them the gross figure. You say, yeah, I make like one hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, we all know if you make one hundred thousand dollars a year, you don't bring home one hundred thousand dollars a year. If you make one hundred grand a year from an employer. Right. Then you're probably bringing home something like seventy five, seventy to seventy five thousand for the year. That 70, 75,000 is the net after all the taxes, um, Social Security, Medicare, federal tax, state tax. If you, live in like, if you live in a city like New York, you have local taxes. I know some people watching this video probably don't, they probably live in a state that doesn't have state taxes. Or if you do have state taxes, you're living in a location that doesn't have any local tax. Some of that stuff is unique to us here in the East, on the East Coast. Some of it, not all of it. Um, so what's left over after all that is the net. You can't spend on the gross because you don't take the gross home. You can only spend off of the net. So it's very, very important um, when you're taking job, doing, you're looking for jobs and taking job opportunities. When they tell you, hey, you, may, you can make $80,000 a year. Understand, like, if they're, if they're paying you 80, nine times out of 10, you're pro probably taking home maybe like 54 or six or no, excuse me. You're probably taking 64,000 home a year, right? You're getting 80, but by the time they take out the taxes and things of that nature, you probably bring 64 home. So it's important to recognize the difference between the two. Thank you so much for that response. I'm moving into our seventh question for today. What is good versus bad debt? <laughs> <laughs> uh depends on who you talk to right there's some some of my contemporaries they'll tell you there is no such thing as good debt um all debt they'll say all debt is bad i don't agree with that i think there is certain things that are good debt. good debt is something like it's something that you have you see this in real estate often so sometimes in real estate, you either have a mortgage. I'm talking about like rental property stuff. Either you have a mortgage sometimes or you have investors that have helped you buy the property or buy properties. That's all mortgage and investors. That all is the same thing is debt. Somebody meaning somebody has to be paid off. I got this because somebody helped us or me get this. And now I owe them a certain dollar amount in order to be free and clear, right? So is there good debt? In my opinion, yes. Any debt that causes you to acquire a piece, uh, acquire an asset that is producing money up and above the debt, the monthly debt, in my opinion, good debt. So what am I saying? If you own a, if you bought a rental property, right? Because you see this often in real estate. If you bought a rental property and the rental property has a debt load of, let's say, $2,000 a month, right? That's because you borrowed money to get the property. So it's going to cost you like two grand a month, right? Everything, all your operating costs, is the, the, all your operating costs, the debt, the utilities, escrow for repairs, everything is like $2,000 a month. But the property is giving you $2,500 a month. Right, which is five hundred dollars positive cash flow, twenty five hundred minus the two thousand, five hundred dollars positive cash flow. In my opinion, that's good debt. Bad debt is when you just do stupid stuff and you go and buy wants on credit. That's bad debt because the wants 
can't make you any money. They usually don't. They might have, they might, they, they might allow you to have a good time. I won't say that. I, I won't say it doesn't. It might allow you to have a good time. It might allow you, and I know this generation is about creating memories. It might create memories for you, but it doesn't put any money in your pocket, right? It's not making you any money. So do I, which M do I want? Memories or money? If you leave it up to me, it's money, right? We can, we can create the memories, right? Because there's always going to be a memory. If you're broke, you're going to have memories, <laughs> right? If you're broke, you're going to have memories. You, you create, we create memories without having money, <laughs> right? We, we create memories, right? Bad memories, a lot of times, some happy ones too, because I've been broke before, right? I've, 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 I've seen that. I've seen what that looks like. So you, we have, I have memories. I have some good memories and I have some bad memories, right? But the memories of being financially comfortable are far better than those when I was broke. So yeah, if I'm picking an M in this part of my life, I'm saying money. Not to forsake the memories, but money for sure. So yeah, I, I I think there is good debt, but I think there's also bad debt. Bad debt is just like stupidness. You know what I'm saying? You you go buy you go buy a Gucci belt for like eight hundred dollars. You have two hundred dollars in your bank account, but you got this credit card. So you throw the Gucci belt on the eight hundred dollar Gucci belt on your credit card. Like that's probably gonna make you a little. It'll probably make you a little well known, right? You'll get a little popular for a minute, right? It might get you, depending on what neighborhood you grow up in, it might get you robbed, right? Because you know, everybody ain't safe, so it might get you robbed. It might cause you some unwanted attention, right? But what it what it probably doesn't do, it probably doesn't make you any money. That's bad debt, in my opinion. Nah, I very, I very much agree. And also adding to the point that I grew up broke too, and I I I I enjoyed my life. I had some of the best and most fun memories of uh, being broke. So to me, you don't necessarily need money to have fun. Uh, so on that point, um, with me, is is the money, not the memory, because I don't need money to have fun. I can do so many other things that don't involve me spending money that will bring back memory. And so I, I'm choosing money. At this point in my life, I'm choosing the money. Uh, I'm, I'm going into my senior year next year and then I got college, so I'm focusing on money because I got to pay for college. <laughs> so I'm focusing on the money. I like it. I like it. And speaking of good debt, uh, this would be definitely my college stuff will be a good debt because it's my education. So I'm going to be profiting off of the money that um, was spent. I will say this. College can be a good debt. It can be, depending on what you, you do with it, right? Um, it can be. I, it's That's up to the individual. Up to the individual. And, and, and you're talking to someone with multiple degrees on both the graduate level and the undergrad level. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm very much into education. This is people that are, that go at, depending on what area of, of work you're into, right? What career path you're taking. Um, you 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 can go after too much education and make yourself a career student. It's all right to be a career student learning stuff from books, right? From reading books and mentors and things of that nature. But career student from like collegiate level, to me, that's when it starts becoming, eh, I don't know if this is such a good debt issue anymore. This may be bad decisions, right? Um, it may be well placed, well thought out, but it may be a bad decision, right? Like if you 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 go and I see this often. I had a I had a friend. We were um in college, and toward the end of the club, she graduated, but then had to change her major altogether because she realized when she got out of school, this is not what she wanted to do. <laughs> it's like, huh? Like yo, you didn't forget, you didn't you didn't kind of figure that out in all the coursework you were doing. Like, you didn't realize, like, yeah, this is not clicking with me right now. It was, she graduated, completely graduated, got out of school. And that happens with some people. Got out of school, completely tried to jump into an industry. And it just, she got a job in the industry and just wasn't feeling. It just wasn't, it wasn't her thing. And then I, I don't know if she went back to school, but I know she jumped in another industry and it seemed to click. It just seemed to click. So, 
Yeah, education is one of those, to me, is one of those, depending on what happens, depending on what you do with it. Not the result, but depends on what, you, what the person does with it, right? Because there's a lot of educated, well-educated people that just haven't done anything. Well-educated. And I'm not just talking about street education. I'm talking about formal education that just haven't used it. They, they, they're working in a factory. But, yo, you have a PhD. Why are you here? Just wasn't what they were supposed to do. Well-educated, though. So education is funny like that. But we're here to talk money, not philosophy. So let's mm. go. <laughs> uh, moving into our A question for today. Why does a good credit score matter? Good credit matters. Um, it, it probably doesn't matter as much as people think it does, but it does matter. Um, if you're if you're trying to get a loan or something, good credit matters. If you're trying to buy a house and you can't buy it in cash and you need a mortgage, good credit matters. Does it matter for anything else? Unfortunately, the way this country is set up, it does. It really does because if you don't have good credit and you can't pay for it in cash, whatever it is, and you need some kind of credit, like you need to put it on like a credit card or something like that, or uh, you know some kind of loan, you may get the loan, but if your credit score is bad, you're going to pay a lot more money than somebody that's looking for the same item that has a better credit score, right? Um, case in point, guy walks into a car dealership, he's ready to buy a car, nothing fancy, just something regular, something respectable, but brand new. Dealership says, Yo, we can give you this car for $400 a month. He's like, Great, that works because my last car that I had, I was paying $525 a month for. It. So, this is a newer car, and I'm paying $125, $100 to $125 less per month. Okay, great. Then they check his credit. <laughs> the same vehicle that they just quoted him because they, when he walked in, they assume if he's here, he has decent credit. So they gave him the rate like they give you on TV. The rate they give you on TV for a vehicle is somebody that has like a 750 credit score. Like a, they always say A plus or A1 credit, right? That's, that's the, like, the, that's like the, 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 the hood term, A1 credit, right? It just means that your credit score is good. Now, when, they, when he... When they, now they get to the credit department to run all this credit, they find out this dude's credit score is like in the 500s, low 500s. So now that $400 quote they gave them, they got to rip that up. Now that same, the same vehicle, they haven't switched vehicles. He can qualify for the loan, but instead of paying $400 a month, he's going to pay $689, almost $700 a month. That's what good credit does for you. Oh, excuse me. That's what bad credit does for you. It makes you pay for pay more for something than somebody with a better credit score. That's really the bottom line. That's that's for everything. That's for a car. That's for a house. That's for anything that has to deal with credit. That's just the way it works, unfortunately. Oh, and also with credit, something I learned is that don't spend what you don't have. So if you don't have that amount of money in your account, please do not spend it because this is loan money, meaning that you have to pay that money back the longer that you don't pay it back the more interest they're going to add on and this is not like um uh, a personal thing where i could i could um say brother frederick loaned me for 500 dollars, then i disappear and i don't have to pay it back you know this is like a legal thing which means it's going to be on your record it's going to be on your paper this is all the conjunction because when you sign the, um, the credit card company it's basically like a contract. It's a contract. So all of this would be rectified, and then they can take you to court over there, and they're going to get their money. So be very, <laughs> careful, be very careful. And also one thing that I learned, I was in a, a meeting where they were talking about credit score, and the guy told me, try to spend 30% of the limit that you can spend. If you can spend uh, 1000 20 to 30%, yeah. Try to, try to only spend a uh, 300 or it's somewhere between 200 of that money. Don't, don't try to go Makes over sense. the 50% or like the 40% mark. For, your, for the sake of your credit score, you, you need to keep your credit, what they call credit utilization, um, 
to between 20 and 30 percent. Some people say 30, I say 20. Right. Some people do say 30. 30 will get it, a, it will increase it a bit. 20 is better. To all, even if so, if even if the credit limit is like ten thousand dollars and you spend eight grand, right? Is as long as you're paying at least six to get it to two two thousand two thousand dollars, you you'll be good. You'll be good. In most cases, you'll be good. You know, obviously, depending on if you're paying your bills on time, there's no late charges, late late latenesses, and things of that nature. You've had your credit for a while. There's about six or seven factors that affect your credit. Um, but the major ones is making sure that you pay it on time, that u- utilization number or utilization percentage, and um, how long, you know, how long you've had credit. You know, all of that stuff affects your credit score. Definitely affects your credit score. Yeah, for sure. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much for that. We're going to move into our second to last question for today, which is the number nine question. How can big loans affect a person's life? Yo, so here, here's how that it's just so it, it works the same way that you going back to that utilization, right? Um, let's say you have a you you buy a house, but before you buy the house, you have like a, a 800, 775 credit score, right? So the moment the house comes on your credit report, what most people don't realize, the moment it hits your credit report it actually drops your score a little bit because there's this huge loan on the credit report now and there's not a lot of it paid off. The the utilization number is lopsided, right? And that's if you have no latenesses anywhere else. What you'll notice though, over time, as you begin to pay that loan, you'll start seeing over time that even though your credit score dropped lower over time, it begins to increase because you're getting that utilization number down. So as as long as there are no latenesses, as long as you've had some credit for some time, what happens as you pay that loan, your credit score goes up. Even with a car loan, you see the same thing. You have a 70, 75 credit score. You get a car, you have to put it, you know, you don't have the cash to pay for the car outright. So you get it financed then what happens is your credit score drops a bit. It doesn't drop as lo- as much as it does with a house, but it drops a bit. And then you'll see over time as you pay that loan down, again, as long as there's nothing else late, there's nothing late, and you've had credit for a while, you'll notice that the credit score improves. Then something happens interesting at the end of, in particular for a car, right? It happens with the house too, but you see it faster with a car because car loans are usually like three, the, the loans are in terms of like three years, depending on your credit. If your credit is bad, then they probably give you five to six years just to get the payments down, right? Um, but let's say you got, good, got a good credit. So a person with a 775 credit score, their rate, I mean, their term is going to be usually like three years, right? Maybe even in some cases two, but usually about three years. Um, you'll see at the end of the term, now that the car is completely paid off, your credit score may still drop a little bit, but that's how, those are how loans affect your, that's how they affect your credit score, right? Um, They, they, they will, as long as you're taking care of it and you don't look what they consider, they, you don't look like you're overextended on paper Um, because there are a lot of people with good credit that have good credit scores, but they're overextended on paper, meaning they have multiple assets. And you see this often in, um, African-American communities where the person took, has taken care of themselves financially. They have multiple assets like properties and things of that nature, mortgage. So on paper, because they only make a certain dollar amount, let's say they make $150,000 a year, but they may have seven dollars to $800,000 of real estate, maybe a million dollars of real estate um, on a credit report but they're not making any money from those properties because maybe they bought a house for their daughter, their son, or their, you know, their parents or something like that, right? Because they had the credit and they were able, they're able to pay it off. Um, in some cases, you look overextended on paper, even though you have a great credit score and you still can't get the loan because the banks won't, will say you're overextended. So if we give you this, this additional loan and something happens, you're not going to be able to pay us. Um, 
So, you know, it's still every this whole money game is just what that it is. It's a it's a science. It's a game and a science because one plus one doesn't always equal two when it comes to this finance stuff, especially as you become more become more advanced at it. It doesn't equal two all the time. A lot of times you got it is one plus one is like four. <laughs> right. Um, it's just funny like that sometimes. But it's, it's a science and a game that you got to. You got to figure out the rules. And once you have the rules in place, then you'll be able to play the game um, a bit more accurately, a bit more um, concisely because you got you already know the rules. Right. If that if that makes sense. Very much. Do. Thank you so much for that response. Sure. Now we're going into our last question for today. Can a person be an entrepreneur entrepreneur without taking on much debt? That's possible. Depends on the business. Depends on the business. When I first started my business, I didn't have debt. When I first started, I didn't have debt. Um, as we continued on and we wanted to grow, then I had to take on some debt in order to grow. But in the beginning, there was no debt at all. None. Um, because I took what I had saved up and I started. That's what I did. Um, when I was saving the money, I wasn't saving it to buy a business, to own a business. I wasn't doing that. I was just saving it because I know we need it. I know we need, you always need to put money away for a rainy day, right? I mean, even the scripture said, right, that the ants, right, consider the, the proverb says, consider the ant or consider the sluggard, right? Right? That when it's time to work in the summertime, they work, but they work in the summertime because they know winter is coming and in winter, they can't do what they do in the summertime. So they put something away. Because they know winter is coming, they don't enjoy everything they worked for in the worked for in the summertime, because they know if they live, if they if they survive the summer, there's a winter where they can't get all of this food the way they freely get it in the summertime, right? So the Bible tells us that we should look ahead and plan for times of um, uh, not play, plan plan of times plan for times where it may not be as abundant as it is now, right? When, which, when, when Solomon is telling us to consider the ant or consider the slugger, right? So we get that. But um, that wasn't, that's the only reason I was saving money at the time. Um, <coughs> being a business owner per se, uh, at least a full-time business owner, it really wasn't on my radar. It really it just wasn't. It was something that um, I was working full-time and I had some clients on the side and what ended up happening, it came to a point where I had to make a decision either to service these clients or um, let them go and, 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 and just work full time. And, you know, I, I really felt the Lord impressed to say, you know what, uh, impress upon me to you need to let the job go. And I was like, wow. And, and you know, that's what I did. So in the very beginning. Nah, there was no debt at all. I can't even tell you that I started and we had massive debt. Nah, not at all. As, like I said, as we begin to, to four or five years in, as we wanted to expand and do other things and get into other markets, yeah, then we took on a slight, took on a slight debt load for the business. But um, it depends on the business. I mean, I, if I guess if I had to buy tons of equipment and things of that nature, I probably would have had a debt load. But for what we do, we don't need tons of equipment, right? We just we just need computers and stuff. We don't need tons of equipment. So yeah, you don't have to, but it's possible that you might have to have that in the beginning. It's possible, depending on what you do. This is it for the video, guys. This was part two of the video learning about finance. Guys, so much for the audience for watching and to continue to come back to the videos to always listen to knowledge and be educated. If you haven't already, like. Subscribe if you're new. Please turn on your post notification. Anytime I upload, YouTube will send you a notification. This is Motivation Parent Christian. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.